Good evening, everybody. Greg McDermott with Cyber Trading University welcoming you to our free options FBC, uh, Delta and the Black Shoals model. I appreciate everyone joining us this evening. Uh, we are going to uh, talk a little bit tonight about uh, the ever, ever elusive uh, Delta touch on the Black Shoals model. We're going to begin by giving you, you know, a couple of ideas why trading options is such a, a big, should be a, such a big part of your, um, your trading day. Uh, and then we've got a great offer that I have uh, just literally just put together today uh, for the class tonight that I think you'd be very interested in. So looks like we might have a question up. Great. That's what we want to hear. Good sound. Let's go to the required elements of our program. The risk disclaimer. Please take a moment to read that. I'm going to leave that up there for a moment for everybody. There we go, guys. My favorite slide, or what well, I got to say, my mother's. Uh, that is me, Gregory McDermott. Earned my Master's of Applied from Finance in Finance from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, in '89. Bachelor of Financial Management from St. Joseph's University in 1987. I was a crude oil options market maker at the NYMEX. I was the head options market maker for JAS Securities uh, at the Philex. And while I was there, I managed our firm's portfolio risk for our team of. Uh, 10 options floor traders who worked for me. I was also a market maker in the Dell computer crowd, which doesn't sound that impressive right now, but uh, back in the day, it was the busiest equity option traded in the United States. Uh, directed an all-floor trading unit for JAS Securities, and while I was there, I was qualified by the ISE, the ICE, um, the International Security Exchange, as a DTR. First, I just want to touch I don't know where everybody comes from uh, for our, our webinar this evening, so I just I do want to talk about the, the, the strength, the power of options. And again, we've I've got a presentation where we, we spend an hour talking about why there's a gigantic advantage for you as a trader to have options as part of your um, your skill set. I'm going to touch on one of those, and it's one of the ones that doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, and and what I really think is a, is a big advantage of trading options. Then we're going to talk about the Black-Scholes model and Delta. Uh, but the one fact you can't argue is that options offer you a superior alternative to shorting stock. Lots of people in America, lots of people around the world have been brainwashed to believe that, you know, up, they come from a background of stock traders, that up is good, down is bad. And you can't root for the downside. You know, that's like, watching Rocky IV and rooting for Ivan Drago. You know, you don't root for Ivan Drago, the Russian guy. You root for Rocky. You root for up. Everyone wins when we go up. Well, it's really not the way um, trading happens. And even in, in markets like we've had where the markets have been in general up over the last couple of years, there's a significant amount of opportunity to trade the downside. And if you have to sit on the sidelines because you're unwilling or unable to, to trade the downside – you're limiting the opportunity you have in the market, and that's one of the strengths. Done correctly, 
uh, with either the, the purchase of outright purchase of a put, the purchase of a vertical put spread, the sale of a vertical call spread, none of these being positions that would put you in a um, an unlimited loss position. They're measured risk downside trades, just as if you wanted to trade the upside. You could trade the opposite. Up, down, doesn't really matter in options. And that's, I think, one of the keys. Um, it's one of the things that is foreign to a lot of people because of the belief up is good, down is bad. And this allows you to profit on down moves. And hey, there's nothing wrong. Money's money. Profit's profit. Don't don't think about, geez, I only want to make money on the upside. You're limiting the opportunity you have to grow your capital and improve as a trader. So a couple of the reasons why it's superior, one of it's the margin requirements. A lot of a lot of times it's it's very, very expensive to be able to um, to carry the margin required by your brokerage firm to be short a stock. The other thing a lot of people don't know is to be short a stock, you literally have to be able to borrow that stock from someone who is long it. I know that sounds rather arcane and archaic, but it's true. Uh, I remember as an options trader on the floor, Dell Computer, again, way back in the day, um, used to be what we called hard to borrow, which meant there were more people who wanted to short the stock than there was long stock available to be lent out for a fee to the short sellers. So every day we would get, um, nice lady Michelle would come down and say, hey guys, there's 50,000 um, to buy in. Um, and what that meant was that there's a possibility if by the end of the day the clearing firm didn't have enough uh, borrowers, people willing to lend stock as those short, if there was a discrepancy, they would take away short stock. Well, one day I walk in and find out that they have taken 10,000 of my short shares away, and I'm now longer 10,000 deltas than I thought I was. Um, the guy who used to be our, our uh, who managed our firm called up our our clearing firm, now Goldman Sachs, then Spearleads and Kellogg, ripped off some, I'm sure, very, very, very colorful words, explaining to them how they were never to take our fill-in-the-blank stock again. Now, this story has a happy ending because, you know, as rarely happens, but in this time it did, um, Dell opened up slightly higher. I was able to resell my 10,000 shares of stock, made a few bucks. The good guys won one for a change. But the margin requirements and the, the limitations of short stock can and are real. You don't have that problem with options. The SEC has their own little uh, take on uh, on selling, you know, selling stock and being short stock uh, because of past crashes and uptick rules. There are ways people try to circumvent the uptick rule. The easiest way to circumvent it is to go buy some puts or a put spread or sell a call spread. That's the easiest way, and don't worry about the margin implications. And there are some brokers out there who just will not let you short stock because of the ultimate risk that you know you short a stock in theory it can go to infinity. I've yet to see one go to infinity, although some of the holders of stocks like Priceline may feel like it's gotten to infinity. But you put yourself in it if you are just simply short stock. You put yourself in an, an unlimited loss position, and your broker rarely will let you put yourself in that position without a significant capital reserve. And you can have a small account and, and be long puts, which would allow you to profit from a downside move um, with very little at risk. And the best part is a completely measured risk. It's, it's one of the advantages. We're not going to spend much time on it, but done properly, when you enter an options trade, you can tell exactly what is your maximum loss and, it, and in general, what is your profit potential. Sometimes the buying of a put, again, theoretically can go to infinity, but it normally doesn't. But you have that, uh, that, uh, that advantage. Um, again, those, some people, and, and there are traders who are just afraid of it, you know, that, that up is good, down is bad. They're just afraid to be short because they feel like stocks always go up. All of these things negatively impact, uh, you know, a trader um, if you're trying to trade the downside by using just simply stock. And that's why I believe options provide safe, risk-managed, appropriate trades that allow you to capitalize on the downward move in an underlying. Um, and again, I did touch on that. Literally, you have to have short stock available um, to be able to, uh, to trade short stock. You have to have borrowable stock available. So options eliminate all of these concerns. Again, there are lots of really great reasons why 
um, you should you should trade options. There's there are gigantic advantages. In fact, you could argue that um, for the right stock, um, trading options is better than being long the stock uh, for the right for the right situation. Again, a conversation for another night. I want to jump into you know touch on that Black Shoals model and make sure you guys get a good feel for Delta as we begin to get ready for our workshop coming up in a couple of weeks. And uh, a new uh, a new announcement about our, our cyber group. So let me check if there are any questions while uh, while we pause here and kind of shift to our next topic. The Black Shoals model. Now, I'm going to go over very I'll give you a cursory look at what the Black Shoals model was. It's developed historically by uh, Fisher Black and Myron Shoals, in, uh, first introduced in their 1973 paper, The Pricing of Options and Corporate Liabilities. The, the goal of the options pricing model, the Black Shoals model, was originally to figure out a way to hedge options uh, risk. So they would take the risk that they had in a position and try to figure out a way to hedge it in an effort to mitigate the risk in options. Now, again, we're talking about 1973. We'd barely gotten to the point where we had puts and calls at this point. So we're talking the very early days of options trading, and this first model was used to say, okay, if I have this option trade on, how can I use the available information? What sort of inputs do I need in an effort to try to mitigate the risk or maybe lock in some profit? And we'll talk about that with Delta coming up. Um, but it was originally out in 1973. The assumptions, uh, rather limiting and today rather um, out of date, but they did allow us to begin the conversation and the development of, you know, seemingly infinite number of models now that can give you options pricing with all sorts of levers and bells and whistles to pull and push um, to get you prices where you feel they are accurate. It's funny people always talk about. Um, fair value. And you'll hear traders talk about that, but as a retail investor, um, the, the search for mythical fair value is really, is really kind of fool's gold because for you as a trader, um, fair value is whatever the bid offer spread is right now. There is none. But the assumptions that the Black-Scholes model was built on was European exercise. What's a European exercise? It means that the options cannot be exercised um, the rights, if you're the owner, cannot be exercised until expiration. Now, any of the options that you would trade in the in the U.S. equity markets right now are all um, are all American exercise, which means you can exercise them at any time. Uh, again, these are the, the basic assumptions of the original model that the risk-free rate and volatility remain constant. Well, in the in the last few years, assuming the risk-free rate is constant is not a gigantic leap and probably a very um, viable and reasonable assumption. The, the assumption that volatility remains constant is not, and that's why later models have come along and improved upon um, the Black Shoals original pricing uh, model. Stocks pay do, no dividends. We all clearly know that that is not true. Um, markets are efficient. Um, I, I will leave the condescending comments and the snickering to others. Let's just say that this was the original assumption, whether markets really are efficient or not, is a debate probably for economics class and until, um, uh, you know, for another day. So we're just going to assume that they are efficient. Um, but again, we probably could easily argue that, you know, at least in some cases, they are not. Now, again, uh, to quote Will Farrell quoting George, um, George W. Bush, uh, I didn't think there was going to be any math questions. Um, this is not a test. This is just a quick um, look at the actual original uh, mathematical equation that got us the Black-Scholes model. And the reason that I bring this up is not because there's a test at the end. Um, with computers today, uh, I can tell you that that would be uh, you know, probably a waste of time. I remember many, 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 many years ago trying to program this model well before we ever had um, – handhelds on the trading floor as a clerk at the sitting in the balcony at the American Stock Exchange. Uh, I can remember trying to program this into my Hewlett Packard HP 12C, which I still have. I have the, the calculator. I never got the program because I couldn't come out. I couldn't figure out a way to come up with the cumulative distribution function 
a function of the standard uh, normal distribution. That was the piece that got very difficult for me. So what I do want to show you here, though, is that a number of the factors that we look at for the Black-Scholes model and for any options pricing model are readily available, well-known, easily discernible. So there are only a couple of things you need to focus on that are kind of the moving parts. We all know how much time there is to expiration, right? We all know we all have a calendar, so we know that the expiration this coming month is uh, March 20th, which means we've got 20 days in March, and I'm looking at my watch quickly here, and we've got four more days, so 24 days left until the expiration. We all know that. We all know what the underlying price is for our asset, or here uh, depicted by S, the spot price. We all know what the strike, pri strike price or ex exercise price and month for our option is. We all know what the risk-free rate is. The real variable here is um, is the standard, uh, the, the volatility of the return of the underlying asset or the volatility. So that's the piece that drives the, val the pricing and that's the hard part. That's where it, it, this goes from a, a, a nice simple civil conversation into heavy-duty math trying to come up with you know what is the volatility for a particular um, for a uh, volatility input for a particular uh, option. So we're not going to go any more into the Black-Scholes model. We're going to have a workshop coming up. We're going to dive you know, head first into the Black-Scholes model. But what I do want to do is I want to talk about the Greeks, which are the, um, the measures that are given off by the model that we just talked about. And they're, they're, you've heard of all of them. I'm going to touch on a number of them. I'm only going to really go into talking about Delta as our um, as our topic for the evening, we will talk about the rest of these in in depth in our um, in our workshop coming up in a couple of weeks. So first, we're going to talk about Vega. I just mentioned it there. Vega. What is the Vega? It's the measure of the effect of change in volatility on the price of an option. I just I just told you that that's the piece that's a little bit of a of a wild card. It's the one that gets prices moving. Um, to extremes or keeps them very, very tight. You could take two stocks that have you know, all the same days to expiration, underlying stock price, exercise price, and for example, right now, I guess 3M is probably trading a lot higher than Apple is off the top of my head, but just if you took two stocks like Apple and 3M, um, you could have very similar stock prices days to expiration, exercise prices, and, you know, dividends for 3M would probably cancel and affect it a little bit. But their volatility number would be significantly different. Why is that? Well, you would expect a stock like Apple, and we've seen in the past, the historic movement of Apple has been greater than, an example, you know, that of 3M. So the volatility is higher, and that's what the volatility tells us. What should you expect the movement of the underlying? There's an old trader trick floor trader trick, if you're trying to figure out how much should the underlying, in this case, stock move in a day based on the current implied volatilities. And what you used to do is you would, you would divide it by, you divide the annualized number by 15. So if a stock had a, it was a $100 stock and the volatility was 30, you would assume ballpark that in any day you should see you know, two out of three days, you should see no more than a 2% move in that stock. So for a $100 stock, $2 up or $2 down. Um, why do you pick 15, Greg? Well, it's really the square root. To go from annualized to daily, you would take the square root of the number of trading days in a month to drop down an annualized volatility number to a daily volatility number. And since the square root of, of 25 is probably off the top of my head something like you know, 16 point something or 17 point something, but I do know that the square root of 225 is 15. So as an approximation, we would use those if you're trying to get a feel for, okay, what, the volatility that I'm paying, what what does it really mean when, when it comes to the movement of the underlying stock? What is the the price of this option is, in, is um, building in this sort of an anticipated movement in the underlying. And that's one of the ways you can determine does volatility seem high or seem low based on history. 
Um, where do you see volatility get really high? Usually around you know, announcements, earnings, if the Fed's making movements, or in general, if the market moves sharply to the downside, in, in general, volatility moves up as people go to buy uh, puts as protection. Um, and the one thing about Vega is it can be a cumulative measure to help you measure the, the, the volatility risk of the options in a portfolio. What's theta? Theta is the measure of the effect of the passage of time on options price. And we call this time decay. Uh, what does that mean? When you buy an option, the clock starts ticking towards its eventual expiration. It's an asset that loses value. All things equal, an option is worth less tomorrow than it is today because there's one less day that that option can move either in the money or farther in the money. So when you buy an option, you, you, own, you own the option. You have some other positive features of the Greeks. You would be um, long gamma, for example, but you would always be losing money every day. And a lot of times people will, will, will try to balance the, um, the value that's depreciated, the value that's disappearing because of time decay versus the expected movement, just touched upon it earlier, in Vega. And, and can I get my stock to move enough that I can make money before my options expire? And it's sort of a, a race. And one of the ways I like to use the analogy is, is sort of that sands through the hourglass. You know, time is ticking when you buy an option. Um, and the opposite of that is if you sell options, you start all things equal, your options are worth less tomorrow than today, you would profit from the simple passage of time. Although from our other Greeks, you're then short, for example, um, volatility, uh, which can be a, a good thing, can be a bad thing. I'm not just, I'm just trying to lay out the, the idea. So theta measures the passage of time. Vega measures the, the impact of volatility. Let me check what our, uh, see if we have any questions here. I can't seem to grab my mouse. Uh oh, somebody asked me a math question. I'm going to go back and try to answer it. It is a wasting asset. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't own them, Donna. Um, let me go back and see if I can give you the E. Um, I'm not sure, so I'll, I'm not going to make up something. I'm not sure the answer. I'm not going to pretend that I do. I don't off the top of my head know. I pulled out my old textbook. I could find it for you. Um, Ro. Now, Ro is not that girl you went to high school with named Rosemary. Uh, Ro is the measure of the effect of the change in interest rate on the price of an option. Now, to be fair, over the last few years, Ro, um, the girl you went to high school with, has probably been more impactful on the price of your options than the movement of interest rates because – Movement and interest rates have really been a, uh, a separate topic. We really haven't had a lot of movement. I can remember, though, when rates were higher, significantly higher. Shoot, I remember I bought my first – well, I guess I bought my second house, which is the house I still live in. And I remember getting a an, the mortgage at 7% and was like, sign me up forever at 7%. Um, seems kind of crazy now it, with interest rates clearly down well below 4 But um, interest rate, although it can be impactful – um, at the moment doesn't really in fact affect your position and your options because interest rates just aren't moving. Um, and it, it also is an cumulative. You can figure out the interest rate risk in your position. Being long and short options can make you on some lines long and some lines short um, row. Um, and you can accumulate that to try to give you a, a feel for the real exposure in your portfolio. And that's at, at its next level when you take the options Greeks above um, the simple uh, effect that one option has in your position when you start to aggregate options. You know, myself as a market maker, I would have positions long and short, calls and puts, all the strikes, all the months going all the way out. And then you would try to take this the, the model – would help you sort of um, distill and aggregate your real risk and try to help you identify where there could be holes in your position. Um, and that's the, the, the next level use of options. As an individual trader, that probably is not going to be impactful. But ultimately, as a market maker, that's where it was beneficial for you. Now, we're going to talk about, and the reason, uh, you know, we, we the, the topic, the, the true topic of the night, um, we're going to talk about delta. And I want to try to, 
there, there are three ways to look at delta, um, and we're going to talk about this one first. I'm going to go backwards. The slides are just slightly out of order. Um, but the, 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 the classical definition of delta, what is it? What does it measure? It measures the rate of change in your options price. So how much will the price of an options change based on the movement in the underlying stock, in this case stock? All these uh, apply to whether you're looking at futures, currencies, um, all of them are the same. Stock, uh, it's the rate of change. So what does that mean for you? Well, it means that if a stock, uh, an option has a 50 delta, then and the underlying stock moves up a dollar, you would expect the value of your option that you own, if it's a call, to to go up by 50 cents because that delta was 50. Um, if it was um, you were long a call and the stock went down 50 up down a dollar, you would expect expect the value of your call, pardon me, to go down by 50 cents. And again, it's an approximation that gives you a feel for the impact of the movement of the underlying on the price of your stock. And when we describe options, sorry, when we describe options in general, we will describe sort of the, um, their impact that they have, I mean, we use three terms to describe options, and we'll call them in the money, out of the money, or at the money. Now, pretty self-explanatory. You'll have options that are in the money are options where, for a call, the value, the value of the stock, in this case the stock, is above the underlying strike price. So. If you have a stock that's trading at $75, the 60 call would be in the money. And then using that same example, the 75 call would be, would be at the money. And the 90 call would be out of the money. And those three things kind of give you a description of them. And it also has to, it also, whether it's in the money, out of the money, or at the money, you normally can determine that not necessarily even by the strike, but simply by the delta. If something is a 50 delta option, half, again, de options, deltas can be between zero and 100. Um, it, a 50 delta option is an at the money option. A, a 90 delta option is in the money. And then correspondingly, we would call you know 20 or 30 delta option out of the money in general. So let me skip back up because I, Deltas, you can have deltas for calls, which are always going to be positive or long, and the deltas of puts are going to be negative or short. So if you are, if you're the owner, and again, let's take a moment on this. If you buy calls, you're what we would call, um, you have positive delta. If you sell calls, you have negative delta. If you're long puts, you have a negative delta, and if you short puts, you have a positive delta. So, and again, there they are. I talked about those definitions, the in the money, the at the money, and the out of the money. So those characteristics really function and spin around the deltas that we see. So it's the deltas are determinant of um, their position relative to the strike. So we also have to, and I didn't, I didn't mention this, but we do have an absolute value the calls and the puts on the same line are going to equal 100. Now I'm going to show you right now uh, a quick screenshot, and this is a screenshot from uh, Think or Swim, and I'm going to try to get my mouse to work here. It's been, it believes it's on vacation, I think. I wish I were, but it, it definitely believes it is. So let me try my best here to see if I get this mouse to work. So using this highlighter, our stock is up here. Of course, you always use Apple as your, and I'm going to, let me grab a pen so I contrast it a little bit better for you. And it, when you set up your screens, this is, you know, the strike, pr the price here for the, the stock was uh, 118.93. And what did it tell us? We looked at the front month. So let's say the 119s, 
along this line. That's the at the money call. What's the delta? Well, the delta of our call over here is 50. The delta of our put is 50. And if we look at the in the money, let's say the, the, the 114. The delta of our call is 79 and the 114 puts. Again, you can point out to me that 79 and 20 equals 99. I get it. It's a rounding error. It's, it, effectively, it's, it's uh, the absolute value equals 100. And the same thing you'll see if you go to the 125 calls. The delta here is 14. The delta here is 87. Ooh, 101. There's that delta we lost from down below. So as you can see, it's, it's an easy thing. If I tell you that the delta of a call is 64, you should be able to tell, know that approximately the delta of the corresponding put along the same line is going to be 36. Now, again, I just made up a number there. but So if you – let me take them off so it's a little easier to see. So let's see if we have – See, it looks like we have a question. What's the quickest, best way to determine when an option should be sold? Um, that, that's, Jacob, the, uh, well, first of all, you, you should, I'm never going to tell you to just sell naked short options. Um, you may sell them as a covered call. Um, and it's really kind of a, let, let's just say it's a, that's an essay. That's an that's an essay answer and, and an essay question. And you're looking for a true false answer. There is no easy absolute. When should you sell an option? Um, there are people who will say, "Oh, well, you should never buy options because you know there's some percentage of options, you know, expire out of the money. So you should never, you know, you should never buy options. You should always sell them." I don't agree with that. Um, I don't like positions where you are what you, I would call naked or net short options, where you have put yourself in a possibly unlimited risk position, just not the way um, I trade or teach people about trading. Um, oh, um, well, if you already own an option and you're trying to get out, there, there, there are two ways, and lots of people will teach you about how to turn a losing position into winning position, and one of the things I do is, you should, when you get in the trade, you should be asking yourself, where do I want to get out? And that's the beauty of options is let's say you buy a call, making up numbers here, guys. Let's, let's, we'll use one of the ones in front of us. Let's just say, and again, the, Apple's now trading probably at one, what, 130, so these all, this all did probably happen. Let's say you bought these calls. Let's say you bought the 118s here for $2.80. And when you got into the trade, you thought to yourself, okay, well, I'm – I'm willing to lose a dollar, and I'm looking to make – so that would be a dollar eighty loss. I want to make twice that. As it, so 360 and 280 is 640. So I want to sell this at 640. So when you've entered the trade, you've already determined there's my loss limit and there's my target profit. Now, I always reserve the right to – let you lift, lift and take, uh, lift your limit on the on the on the winner side if you correspondingly move your stop up. So I'm trying to answer a question that's really probably best suited for another forum, uh, but let me try. What what I try to do is if I own an option, we did it today in the um, in the uh, cyber group. There there are times when you should just get out. You know when you've reached your target, just just sell it, particularly as you own an option and it approaches expiration, it's going to start losing value. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, so it, not a great uh, answer, but the question kind of, again, it really requires a, a long essay answer that I don't have time to give right now. Um, so, I, But in general, you should have a plan getting in is where you want to get out. Now, there's what we talked about. That's one of the ways to look at delta is the rate of change. And, and here's what we, we talked about. We've got if you have a 90 delta call, stocks at 100, your 90 call, about an 80 delta. If your stock price is at 11 and the stock moves up a dollar, these calls should be worth 1180. If it goes down, they should be worth approximately 1020. Five dollars, it's a 50 delta. 
Stock's at 100. It goes up a dollar. This should be worth about 550. 50 times the stock price. And then down, obviously, it would be worth 450. And then with a $2 call, stock goes up a dollar. It's only going to be worth two dollars and twenty cents, and if it goes down, it'd be worth a dollar eighty. You know, in this quick example. So that's one of the ways: is how much is my stock going to change? My, uh, pardon me, option price going to change based on the movement of the underlying? And that's the most simple and traditional view of um, of delta. And here's another way, and this was the original idea that Black Shoals were trying to get at. It's the hedge ratio. And we like to think of Delta as a, as a market maker. Delta was always like stock. I'm long a 1,000 Deltas meant I'm effectively long a 1,000 shares of stock. I'm long 100 Deltas. I'm long 100 shares of stock. And I told you we could aggregate that Delta. And I might be long some of these, short some of these, across the month, and, and my net might be I'm long a 1,000 Deltas. Well, if I want to hedge that, then I would sell a thousand shares of stock against that position and effectively hedge myself to zero delta. Again, that would be at that moment zero stock at risk. Now, if you have any sort of a sizable position, it's nearly impossible, if not impossible, to really have a zero delta. Um, I remember when my my daughter was born. Apart, my son was born August thirty first, nineteen ninety eight, and I knew the baby was coming. I hedged my position down as flat as I could get, and that day the market, if, you, if anyone was around back then, the market took a gigantic, got crushed down, could have been down a 1,000. It was down a zillion. Um, in fact, he was born at 929. It was the last good thing that happened that day because the bell rang at 930, and all hell broke loose. And I had a position that you would have thought there was no way there was any risk in it. I had flattened it out like crazy and still took a beat down, not a huge one. Um, but it was a bad day trading. So um, th this idea of the hedge ratio is a moving target. As you as the days go by, as the underlying moves, as the volatility moves, as all these pieces of the Black Shoals model work together, that that delta or hedge ratio will change. It's an active moving thing. It's not like oh, if you if you have one option trade, you can pretty much put a hedge on and within reason you can be done but once you start aggregating significant numbers of, of options you end up with a you know kind of a, a very tough thing that you've got to manage so that's the other way you can look at at Delta is how can I use it to hedge my options position or that hedge ratio and this just shows you a quick example of you know if you are um, long the options the, the deltas will increase as you go your long calls and lo long delta as it increases you will get longer and if you are long puts and the underlying goes down you will get shorter going your way um, and the other way this is sort of a just a general one is a ballpark percentage chance that the options will expire in the money and you could almost call this sort of the de facto prediction of an options chance to be in the money. And let me go back to our example here. Give me one second. I have to bring back. I lost my, there it is, from the current slide. Sorry about that, guys. I lost my little uh, webinar tool. So you could also look at this delta as the approximate probability that the option will will um, settle at expiration in the money. That prediction becomes more accurate the closer, obviously, you get to expiration. Um, but it's a general rule of thumb. It's not set in stone. But as a trader, it's one of the things you think about when you're looking at it. So what does that mean to you? Well, a 20 delta option ballpark has about a 1 in 5 chance of finishing in the money. A ninety a ninety delta option has you know almost a nine a hundred percent about a ninety percent chance of finishing in the money and that's another way to think about the call finishing in the money and conversely back to the question about selling options if you were to sell them you sell that and people will say oh well then you should sell twenty delta options because there's only a one in five chance that it's going to settle 
in the money and the other four times you get to collect the premium and just go along your merry way. Well, yes, but there are no free lunches in the world. And, and yes, I know a guy who used to sell out of the money, you know, they used to call them teeny options. They were one sixteenth bid or one eighth bid. And he would walk around the floor towards expiration and just sell everything that was on the book, hundreds and thousands of them, just sold, 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 sold. And the reality was most times he won. But when he would lose, the only way to play that game was to do it the way he did, which is sell everything and just collect so much premium that the one time you take a hit, it, it's offset by the profits every month. So, um, again, don't go thinking that, wow, Greg's saying a 20 delta option only finishes in the money one out of five times, so I'll just sell those because that's an easy way to make money. No, it is not. It's a great way to blow out your account. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had another screenshot. So as you can see here, smarter than I thought. I knew I'd put a screenshot in. Um, the delta here is 83, probability in the money, 81.33. Now, again, and this was about 12 days to go till expiration. Over here, just pick another, you know, approximately 43, there's a 43 delta with about a 44.77 chance. Um, you go to these out of the monies. Negative 13 delta, there's about a 14.5% chance right there that it will be in the money. So, again, just one of those trader things, another way to look at and process the information put before you. Um, I do want to talk about, just briefly, the, the idea of how deltas move. And when we have our workshop, uh, we're going to talk about this more. But what, as you'll see, they call this Trumpification. It has nothing to do with Donald Trump although it would be really cool if it did. What it does say is if you just looks at the simple shape of this graph appears to be, and again, you're now asking, Greg, what would you do with all the money your parents gave you for drawing lessons because you clearly didn't go to class? Um, yeah, I'm not very good at this. So that trumpet look, this is, what is this chart showing us? It's showing us that as we approach expiration, this is, 30 days to expiration, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days, 360 days. In general, your options will tend to have lower deltas the closer you are to the strike. Now, you know, you can still get an 80 delta option. A three hundred a year out. The problem is that thing's going to be have to be really, really, really in the money. What would you, what do I mean by that? Well, if it's a hundred dollar st uh, stock, and you wanted to buy the call that's a ninety delta out a year from now, the strike would probably have to be down around, depending on the volatility. And again, that would determine it. Um, it could be down at fifty or sixty, but as you get closer to expiration, so let's just say, as in our example, let's say out here to get uh, a 90 delta, or let's say an 80 delta, an 80 delta call a month from expiration, let's say it's like the, let's do this again. So a year out, An 80 delta call with the underlying – man, this won't do it. Well, let me draw so I'll just talk it through. So here's my point. If you needed an 80 delta option, an 80 delta option a year from now, you might be at about the 60 strike if the stock's at 100. But if you got to 30 days from expiration and the stock was, and the, the stock was trading 100, you might be able to get – you know, it might be the 85 or even the 90 strike might be 80 delta. Why? Well, one way to look at it, it's about 80% chance that it's going to finish in the money. What's the other thing? Well, to hedge it properly, you'd need to hedge about 80 shares of stock for every 100, um, every one option. Or the other way would be, what is, the, um, what is my percentage movement? All of those things. So as you get closer to expiration, the deltas tend to move towards the extremes of 
of either plus or minus 100 or zero. Whereas the farther you are out, normally they tend to head towards the mid-range of uh, deltas. So let me check if there are any questions. Yeah, delta is a function of time. It, they all sort of work together. And here's the other thing that delta is a function of, and it's a function of gamma. Well, what is gamma? Gamma is the rate of change of the rate of change, or the rate of change of delta. And what I like to call it is it measures the velocity of price change for delta. So remember I told you in our example that if you had a, a 50 delta option, the underlying stock went up a um, dollar, your option price should go up by 50 cents. Well, the truth is, depending on where you are, how many days to expiration, how impactful gamma is, that option could be worth, you know, if it went up 50 cents because of the delta, it could go up another penny because of gamma or another five cents because of gamma. So it's how quickly does delta change? And again, if you look back to our last, you would imagine, not surprising, that gamma is going to have a much bigger effect as we get closer to expiration as everything sort of settles up, but a year from now, a year out, gamma doesn't have, it's not quite as impactful. And, and why is it as we approach expiration? Because once we get to expiration, all bets are off, everything's done, options are either in the money or out of the money. And we don't care whether they're in the money by a nickel or, or $50, they're 100 delta, they're in the money. And that's where we move towards, as we get closer to expiration, we go to zero or 100. We kind of get out of the middle. There's no 50 delta options at, at, at expiration, unless, God forbid, there's a pin. That's a story for a different day. So as to the question about time, time does impact it. And all of those things at some point um, work together within the Black-Scholes or whatever options model you're using um, to determine our value. Um, so the option ga gamma gives you the, expresses the rate of change of the rate of change. Positive gamma means normally you get positive gamma from owning options. You'd be you'd be positive gamma from owning options. You'd be negative gamma from shorting options. Now you're saying to me, Greg, well, why wouldn't you always just be positive gamma so that if, as your options go up and up, they get more and more valuable, and as they go down, if you're long puts, they get more and more valuable. Well, the other side of gamma is theta. Yes, you can own the options. And you have to hope that they move because every day, what do we know? Tick, 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 tick. Talk, the clock is ticking and you're losing time value. So it's not like, oh, we'll just own options because they always go your way. There's a price to be paid for owning the options. And that's where, as becoming a trader, you have to try to find that balance. And that's what we're going to talk about um, coming up. Now, the question becomes, let me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the end here, guys. Uh, and then if, if there are any questions, I'll hang on and make sure I get everybody answered. But the question everybody wants to know is, geez, how the heck do I start making money? Well, if you want to know how to make money, you want to go to our cyber group. Um, and for what they're offering right now is, I'm sorry, is a $29 a week, one week free trial. It's a one week trial for 29 bucks. What does that get you? You get to join the cyber group for five days. What the heck's the cyber group, Greg? Well, it is, I'm sorry, I thought it was there. It is our live screens up trading uh, community where you see every day. Now, it's not options trading right now. We'll get to that in a minute. It's their day trading in stocks you get to watch. And again, you don't get, you don't get us telling you what we did yesterday and, ooh, we've edited this video to make it look like we're really smart. It's screens up, live comments. Our, our traders in New York showing you their screens live, commenting on the market. Fausto comes in a couple of times a day, talks to you. You've got a moderator there all day long, and you've got the other people, just like you, who are making money in this group. And for $29, bucks, you are never going to spend another, a better $29. And on top of that, this, we just decided this today, we're going to move. I've been joining the cyber group um, around midday every day, making uh, options comments. And what we're going to do instead is we've decided that we're going to designate two nights a week 8 to 9 o'clock, and it's going to be um, Tuesday and Thursday nights from 8 to 8.45 or 9. We'll go about 45 minutes or an hour each night, and we're just going to talk about options, and it's going to be much more of an open forum. And if you sign up for the trial for Cyber Group, you get to join us. Uh, we're going to start next week, so you'll get to join us one night as part of your Cyber Group trial, um, and it's going to the options, it's going to be strictly options, and it's going to be um, – as close to me opening up the mics for everybody to talk as I can. I'm going to take your questions. I'm going to answer 
about your position. The gentleman who asked me a question earlier, we could walk through a specific example. Of, hey, this is the Craig, this is the trade I have on. What do you think? You know, what do you think about this? How can I do that? So it's going to be much more interactive. Um, it's less me talking, more us talking. And that's all part of this $29 um, cyber group um, trial that you've got. So if you have any questions, please reach out to your educational advisor, 877-70-CYBER. That's 877-70-CYBER or 877-702-9237. So I appreciate everybody joining us this evening. This is Greg McDermott for Cyber Trading University signing off. Everybody have a great evening. Thanks for joining us.